Hello, I'm John Ward on behalf of Physical Gold Fund and Anglo Far East, and we're delighted as always to have with us here Jim Rickards. Mr. Rickards is an investment banker and investment advisor based in New York, and he also serves on the Investment Advisory Committee for Physical Gold Fund. He's the author of the New York Times bestseller, Currency Wars, The Making of the Next Global Crisis. And more recently, he's the author of The Death of Money, The Coming Collapse of the International Monetary System, also a New York Times bestseller. Welcome, Jim. Thank you, John. Great to be with you. Jim, the world has been a bit short on peace since we last spoke. When we've been witnessing major conflicts in Gaza, Iraq and the Ukraine. Now, Setting aside, if we can, the horrors of war, all this conflict has, of course, enormous significance for the world economy. And today, I'd like to focus with you on one area of conflict, Ukraine. Now, if we use the categories you employ in your books, we can see the Ukrainian conflict in terms of both kinetic warfare, actual shooting, and financial warfare. So let's start briefly with the kinetic side, the actual warfare. To briefly recap, the Ukrainian forces seem right now to be gaining the upper hand and they're closing in on the rebels' major strongholds as we're conducting this interview today. And the Russians, meanwhile, are building up significant forces on the nearby borders. How likely, in your opinion, is a real shooting war here? I think this is uh, highly likely, John. I mean, first of all, we have a real shooting war already. You know, Ukrainian aircraft are being downed at a rate of several a week. Uh, of course, we had this uh, tragedy with the Malaysian Airlines Flight 17, a civilian aircraft with almost uh, 300 lives lost, but which was probably accidental, uh, or at least in the sense that someone launched a missile thinking they were probably shooting down a Ukrainian transport plane of some sort and uh, hit a civilian aircraft, but we don't really know. It's it's murky, but that aside, there are aircraft, uh, helicopters, um, and uh, military transport aircraft, et cetera, being downed almost daily, and there is actual fighting going on. So the question is, will it escalate? Uh, will Russian troops be directly involved? Now, What's going on is this is a doctrine that the Russians are very good at, the U.S. not so good. It's called hybrid war. And hybrid war, even in the kinetic sense, we'll get, we'll get to the financial side of it in a minute, but even in the just the strictly kinetic sense, it means you're using a combination of assets. You have some indigenous fighters, so some sort of pro-Russian separatists or people of Russian ethnicity who live in eastern Ukraine. Of course, remember that Ukraine was a republic of the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics for decades prior to the breakup of the Soviet Union. So it's an independent country today, but historically, you know, really just part of a Russian empire. So it's not surprising that there would be a lot of Russians or Russian uh, people of Russian ethnicity in uh, in Ukraine, particularly eastern Ukraine, which borders Russia, which there are. So you have those indigenous fighters. Then you have probably, you know, Russian commandos, Russian insurgent leaders who are kind of slip over the border. These are the famous uh, little green men who showed up in Crimea there. They may have generic uniforms or purport to be um, uh, separatists, Ukrainian separatists, but they're actually Russian operatives. Some of them f- are from the intelligence services, not just the SVR, which is the uh, sort of Russian equivalent of the CIA. That's their foreign intelligence services, but also the GRU, which is their military intelligence services. So some of these are operatives, paramilitaries. Uh, and then you have the potential for regular Russian troops. And there have been some reports of um, artillery fire and anti-aircraft fire coming from across the Russian border. So you have straight up Russian military, you have Russian operatives in paramilitary and intelligence uh, form, you have indigenous fighters, all blended together in ways that are a little bit difficult to untangle. So this is uh, what we mean by hybrid war. And then on top of that, throw in financial warfare uh, and these tit-for-tat sanctions, which seem to be escalating, something uh, we talked about in prior podcasts and we warned about months ago how that could escalate and spin out of control. And we'll talk more about that. So it's it's a very, um, very subtle, hard-to-untangle mix, uh, hard to analyze. But this is how the Russians operate, and they've operated in the past this way. So I think Putin is a master of this. I just uh, Putin is a, an accomplished martial artist, very high IQ, uh, multilingual, former intelligence officer, and very good chess player. And I think he's demonstrating his chess playing skills on the global chessboard as we speak. 
So, Jim, what are the dangers of this conflict spreading into a Europe-wide conflagration that would drag in NATO and the United States on a military level? I think the odds that this drags in NATO and the United States on a military level are low. Uh, it would. The president has proved a very reluctant to use military force anywhere uh, without debating whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's just the case. I think we can be sort of nonpartisan, non-hyperbolic about it and just treat it as a data point, as a fact in our analysis without getting dragged into some of these uh, contentious debates that go on. But the fact the president has said himself, president of the United States has said himself, that he's very reluctant to use American force. Now, we have these recent developments where some force is being applied in Iraq. It's certainly the last thing the president wanted to do, but it's very surgical, very limited, has a specific goals in mind. But even at that, in, his, in announcing it, the president made it clear that this was something he hoped not to do. And so the idea that anything larger would come out of Ukraine is remote. What it would take, Russia would actually have to invade a NATO ally. Uh, of course, Ukraine is not part of NATO. So it, it's certainly if Poland were involved or the Baltic republics or, or any member of NATO, then yes, you'd have uh, possibly the beginnings of something that looks more like World War III. But I think Putin is smart enough not to do that. And I think NATO will be restrained in the absence of that. So Ukraine itself will not be a cause for a wider shooting war between NATO. It does bear some uh, analogies. You know, we're, we're here remembering or recalling the 100th anniversary of World War I. And we all know that World War I started through a series of action response functions, blunders, miscalculations. Historians look at it and they shake their heads. You know, this didn't have to happen. This was uh, one of the bloodiest, uh, most destructive wars in history, and yet uh, probably fought for no good reason. And analogies uh, bear watching, but I really see this as perhaps more similar to World War II, where Poland was the tripwire, but Adolf Hitler and the Third Reich were able successfully to peel off a half of Czechoslovakia and all of Austria uh, without a shot being fired. So I see Putin more like Hitler trying to take what he can without launching a war. Now, ultimately, Hitler did launch a war by invading Poland, and that triggered a, a declaration of war by the UK and France and, and others who were duty-bound to come to the aid of Poland by treaty. So if Russia crossed into a NATO ally, I do think you'd see something that resembles Hitler going into Poland, where it would be a shooting war among major powers. But I think Putin's smart enough to stop short of that. But he can do a lot, including invading Ukraine, without triggering that function. So I think we'll see more turmoil, more violence, more outright warfare, and probably a Russian invasion of eastern Ukraine. But And that will have ramifications worldwide, particularly financial, and it will certainly affect relations between NATO powers and Russia. But I don't think that by itself will lead to a, a wider war that would include NATO forces. Well, Jim, just before we turn to the financial warfare side, the U.S. has recently accused Russia of violating a major nuclear arms treaty, the 1987 treaty, which the Russians in turn are threatening to abandon. Now, given what you've just said, perhaps this is not such a serious development. Do you have any comment on that aspect of the story? Well, in treaty terms and in terms of international legal norms and strategic thinking, it's a very big deal. But as a practical matter, it doesn't matter because Putin doesn't care. And that, that's, to me, the biggest miscalculation the West has made. Uh, you know, we just talked about how there won't be a, a wider shooting war if this is confined to Ukraine, which I expect it will be. But we are in a financial war. Uh, sanctions are being applied. And, you know, sanctions has a nice sort of clinical antiseptic uh, ring to it. It's one of those neutral words. But the listener should understand this as a financial war. We're fighting a war with Russia right now. It's just that we're fighting it in financial and capital market space and commodity space rather than kinetic uh, space. So that's going on. But the miscalculation the West has made, I think it applies to this treaty, but also to the financial war, and this may be a kind of a good segue into that, is that Putin doesn't care. We put on sanctions. He doesn't care. He escalates the violence. We put on more sanctions. He doesn't care. He escalates again. We put on more sanctions. He puts on counter sanctions and he still doesn't care. And what the West has to understand is that this is not working. Now, the president, uh, President Obama, said made a very revealing comment the other day. And a lot of people criticized him for sounding confused, but he was actually making a point. He was asked at a press, asked at a press conference, are sanctions working? 
he said, we don't know if they're working, but they are working as intended. And that's almost a verbatim quote. You know, listeners can look it up. But he, he said, we don't know if they're working yet, but they're working as intended. And a lot of critics came out and said, well, what are you talking about? You're, you're trying to have it both ways. But what he meant was when he said working as intended, he means that if we ban a certain bank from raising funds or if we ban certain financial transactions or if we freeze certain assets, then yes, those assets are frozen. Those banks are, you know, not able to raise money. So that's what he meant by working as intended. But when he said it's not clear if they're working, what he meant was it's not clear this changing Putin's behavior. And that is the key point, which is, okay, we put the sanctions on and they actually mechanically, we watch them, we watch these banks, we watch Wall Street, we make sure that nobody's lending money to anyone they're not supposed to lend it to, et cetera. So they're at, a, at an implementation level, they're working, but they're not working in the sense of Putin's behavior changing. Now, what's the source of this blunder? I mean, are people dumb? Do they just not get it? And I, I think the source is that, and I see this a lot, that a lot of our strategic thinkers, it's been so long, really decades, since we've had to think strategically in military and kinetic space. We've had brush fire wars, you know, Iraq was a big deal, but, you know, Iraq wasn't a great power. I mean, it was a big war and a lot of lives were lost, but nobody thinks of Iraq as a great power. But when you go up against Russia or China, uh, and actually potentially Iran, you are looking at something that's more, uh, more like a, or it is a great power confrontation. And there, the world has been at peace for a long time, and we've had decades of very strong economic growth, very very weak in recent years, but you go all the way back to the 1980s and you know, the end of the Cold War in 1991, or growth in the 1990s. So really, there's two decades under Republicans and Democrats, the, uh, the Reagan administration, Bush, and, and also uh, Bill Clinton. We had very strong economic growth, and we had walls come down, um, you know, markets were globalized, finance was globalized, and people just became very accustomed to thinking about everything in economic space. You know, uh, capital controls were taken down, uh, free trade treaties were signed, trade expanded, growth expanded, people got richer, middle class. And so I, I think people got used to thinking of everything as an economic problem and forgot about thinking of things as strategic and military problems. And so along comes Putin, who is very much, he, he's like something out of the 19th century. I mean, when, when uh, with, with 21st century technology, when Obama criticized Putin as a, a little bit of a throwback, he was right, and I think Putin's proud of it. Uh, Putin is trying to reassemble the Russian Empire. The Soviet Empire was really a Russian Empire in communist drag, but go back to the uh, 19th century and the 18th century when there was a very ambitious effort to create a real Russian Empire, and I think Putin is really looking more at people like Peter the Great than he is at, uh, you know, Khrushchev or Stalin for his models. And so our, you know, strategists, uh, you know, President Obama's pointed to the U.S. Treasury. There's a, a war room, a financial war room in the U.S. Treasury where they sit around a table and they, they come up with these sanctions. Obama says he's my favorite combat commander. Well, that's a pretty big statement. You think about the, the major combat commands, you know, CENTCOM and PECOM out in, in Hawaii and um, uh, AFRICOM and uh, our major combat commands around the world and, you know, famous generals like uh, you know, General Petraeus and, uh, and others who have, you know, General McRaven, who have a special operations command, who have commanded these forces. And here's Obama pointing to a, a bureaucrat, pretty smart guy, but basically a bureaucrat at the Treasury, saying he's my favorite combat commander. Well, what's the source of this confusion? Well, the source is that Everyone thinks in terms of wealth maximization and efficient markets. And we say, well, gee, if we start to push Russian banks out of the financial system, start to limit their capital raising capabilities, start to uh, impact you know, their, their trade deficit, their economic growth, that's going to be so painful on Putin that he's going to back off because why wouldn't you want to maximize your wealth? Well, the answer is there's more to geopolitics and wealth maximization. Putin is not a wealth maximizer. He's a power maximizer. Now, wealth and power can sometimes run together, but they don't have to. You can spend wealth to gain power with the view that maybe you get more wealth in the long run. And I pointed out, and I point this out in my, my book, The Death of Money, in Chapter 2, aircraft carriers are not free. Uh, the United States is in the process of upgrading our aircraft carrier fleet, our strategic uh, 
uh, fleet. We're going to something called the Ford class after the, the previous classes, the Nimitz class and the Enterprise class. Well, this is a, a trillion dollar exercise to build a fleet of these and then all the support vessels, the land uh, support that goes with it, the communications channels and all that. You know, you're spending a, a trillion dollars or more to, to put all this together and operate it. And so that's not free. So when the president says, well, we're going to impose costs on Putin if he takes Ukraine, well, of course he's imposing costs. And there are costs. The Russian economy is suffering. But Putin says, well, that's a price worth paying. You know, I'm not building, I, Putin, we we in Russia are not building a fleet of Ford-class aircraft carriers, so we're not spending the trillion dollars. We'll spend our money in other ways. In effect, we'll incur those costs in other ways by seeing our economy slow down. But it's a cost worth paying because we're getting Ukraine or we're getting on the securing natural gas routes or we're securing energy customers or we're putting Europe under our thumb or we're achieving other geostrategic geopolitical goals. And so I think that too many of our strategists in Washington are wearing these efficient market hats and they need to take those hats off and put on their geopolitical hats and understand that nothing is free, that opposing costs is just a cost of doing business from Putin's perspective. And that's why the sanctions are not working. Well, is there another aspect of this, Jim, that in a sense on both sides of the financial war, each side is a little bit pussyfooting around because if they really took the gloves off, they'd hurt themselves as much as they hurt each other. In other words, there are significant constraints on the kind of sanctions that America can impose on Russia without damaging its own economy. And conversely, I mean, Russia's just banned food imports. It seems a little trivial. I mean, are they also being a bit cautious in their tit for tat on the sanctions aspect because they don't want to hurt themselves? Well, there's no question about that, John. You're exactly right. If you separate what the U.S. is capable of doing from what we're actually doing, those things are night and day. Let's just talk about the capabilities. It's interesting to observe Putin's behavior. Of all the things the U.S. has talked about and threatened, of course, we haven't done them all. We've actually done very little. But of the things we've talked about, the one thing that sort of hit Putin where it hurts, that he reacted to in, in an immediate and very tangible way, believe it or not, was cutting off MasterCard and Visa. You know, you would think that the banking sanctions or the trade sanctions or uh, the freezing of the assets or going after the oligarchs, you would think that would be more meaningful. No, it's MasterCard Visa. And the reason for that is that, of course, you know, prior to the end of the Cold War, uh, the you know, consumer credit in Russia and the things that we take for granted, like, uh, you know, um, online banking and uh, direct deposit of paychecks and debit cards and credit cards, all those things we take for granted, they simply didn't exist. Now, and then the 90s were a period of turmoil where Russia tried to modernize, but the, the, the corruption and the gangsterism and, and you know, uh, Yeltsin, I think, drinking at three quarts of vodka a day probably didn't help. But, you know, Russia was really in chaos. It wasn't until the early 2000s that Putin was able to establish some order. And they let these, uh, you know, MasterCard and Visa are the largest, you know, uh, payments processors or among the largest payments processors in the world. They're certainly the largest in consumer credit. And they dominate the Russian uh, bank card market. China, interestingly, has their own bank card. I think it's called Unicard, if I'm not mistaken. But, you know, you can use MasterCard and Visa in China. But China has set up their own system. Russia hasn't, uh, at least not to any great extent. And Japan, by the way, has uh, the... Uh, the JTB card, which is very popular. So that's what's used there in addition to MasterCard Visa. So remember, look at the popularity ratings. Obama's popularity ratings are sinking to an all-time low. He's down around 40%. That's the lowest since he was sworn in as president. And once the president gets the three-handle, when you're 39 or lower, you're you're in serious trouble. So that's where Obama is. Putin's approval ratings are approaching 90%. They're in the high 80s and rising now. I uh, make some allowance for the fact that some of that data may be hyped a little bit, but, he, but he's extremely popular in Russia. There is nothing that would make Putin unpopular faster than telling Russians the credit cards don't work or the debit cards don't work. So that's what Putin reacted to. He did two things. He basically told MasterCard and Visa that they had to post a multi-billion dollar bond, a cash bond. And if there were any discontinuity in the processing of credit card transactions, they would forfeit the bond. So right away, you're putting MasterCard and Visa between a rock and a hard place. They are subject to U.S. sanctions. We haven't imposed them. We haven't triggered that. But if we did, they would have to go along 
But on the other hand, Putin's saying, if you do, it's going, you're going to have to forfeit billions. And of course, Putin could then use the billions to build his own system. And in fact, they're now working on their own system. And Russia could turn very quickly to China and say, hey, why don't you guys come in? Your unit credit system works. Your unit card system works. And let's just plug that into our systems. You know, who knows? Maybe they'd hire Oracle or IBM or or uh, SAP or somebody to, to build a system very quickly. So they are. So that's really hitting Putin where it hurts. We could do other things. Uh, the kinds of things we did to Iran, actually, you know, telling a UK subsidiary that they can't raise capital more than one year forward, that's, you know, that hurts a little bit. But telling the Russian banks, you know, VTB, Vinesh Bank and uh, Sperbank, their two biggest banks, that they cannot process dollars anywhere in the world. Or worse yet, going to SWIFT and saying you can't even process other currencies like euros, Swiss francs, and so forth. That would paralyze them. So we haven't done any of those things. Now, why not? Obama said, well, we don't really seem to be affecting behavior very much. Well, I can guarantee you that cutting a VTB out of the global dollar payment system or turning off MasterCard and Visa in Russia would cause a change in behavior uh, immediately. So why don't we do that? The answer is that Putin can push back, maybe not in credit card space, but he can do a number of things, uh, freeze uh, U.S. assets in uh, Russia, dump his U.S. Treasury securities. There's a cost associated with that. But but everything has costs. This idea of pointing to a particular action, say, oh, they would never do that because it would cost the money is nonsense. Of course, it costs the money, but it's a price they're willing to pay. That would um, basically cause a spike in U.S. interest rates, sink our housing market, sink our stock market, etc. But Putin has an even more powerful secret weapon, which is his ability to close um, U.S. stock exchanges. Imagine if he woke up one day and learned that the New York Stock Exchange was closed, uh, no orders were being processed, they were trying to get it reopened. It's almost like the power going out, you know, occasionally in a storm or hurricane or something. The power goes out for a few days, you know, and they eventually restore it. But imagine being told that the New York Stock Exchange was closed. All of your so-called liquid stocks in your 401k were suddenly, uh, in effect, private equity. You had no idea what the price was. Of course, good reason to believe that the price was plunging at that point because there would be panic selling and no idea when the exchange would reopen. That's what Putin can do. So you're right. We are sort of tiptoeing around these sanctions. They have the appearance of doing something. It's probably better than doing nothing. But neither side really wants to escalate. And then the real impact is to world growth. Even the sanctions we have now, which are very tame, are hurting growth in Russia, hurting world trade. And if you look at what the IMF and the BIS, you know, the International Monetary Fund and the Bank for International Settlements, have been saying in their public statements lately, uh, over the past few weeks, you know, Christine Lagarde and uh, the, uh, the Jamie Karuna at the, um, at the BIS, they're saying that world growth is hanging by a thread. You know, they're kind of acting like cheerleaders in terms of what appears to be a good U.S. growth, although uh, that's very superficial, not as strong as uh, second quarter GDP made it appear. But world growth, you know, China's slowing down. Uh, Japan seems to be back in a funk. Parts of Europe are in recession. Uh, the U.S. is not as strong as it looks. Emerging markets are suffering. World growth is slowing down. This whole bubble that's been created the last few years is just starting to, uh, the air is being let out, uh, so to speak. And along comes a financial war with Russia, so that's not helping. And then the third thing, so I say first thing, they don't want to escalate because uh, escalation could lead to the financial equivalent of nuclear war with actually the New York Stock Exchange being closed. And secondly, at, even at best, at best, it's slowing down world growth when, at a time when world growth is, is tenuous. But the third factor, I think, restraining behavior is the idea of an accident. When you get into these complex systems and you get into these game theoretic war fighting scenarios, even in financial warfare, the risk that somebody pushes the wrong button or they push the right button, but there's an unintended consequence and things spin out of control in completely unexpected ways. Now you're back to the World War I analogy. If you had gone to the Kaiser and uh, Emperor Franz Joseph and Lloyd George and uh, the leaders of uh, the major European powers, you know, Tsar Nicholas and so forth, in the, the summer of, uh, of 1914, say June of 1914, if you could have got them all in a room and say, you know, gentlemen, the course you're on will have the following results. 20 million people will be killed. World trade will come to a halt. Your countries will be devastated. 
You'll set the uh, stage for even worse things to come, including Nazism. The Austro-Hungarian Empire will fall. The Ottoman Empire will fall. The Russian Empire will fall. And we'll have the beginning of the bankruptcy of the British Empire and the ultimate demise of the British Empire. Now, do you want to go ahead? In other words, if you had painted that future picture to the leaders, they would say, what are you talking about? We're, we're going to stop this right now. They didn't. They, they didn't think ahead. They didn't understand the consequences. They went ahead and blundered, and all those things came to pass. And so if you start playing footsie in financial space, actually start a financial war, could it lead to a global catastrophic financial collapse that would be the financial equivalent of World War One and World War II combined? The answer is yes, and that all the more reason to pull back. Let me just clarify one small point, if I may, in that very large answer. When you said that Putin could, if he chose, close the New York Stock Exchange, are you referring there to the notorious Russian hackers? Well, yes, but it's not speculation, John. I spoke about this. I've been speaking about this for years, and I, I mentioned it specifically, expressly, in my book, uh, this is also in Chapter 2 of The Death of Money, but let's put some concrete uh, facts on the ground so the listeners can realize we're not just speculating. On August 22, 2013, the Nasdaq was closed for half a day, just shut down. They have never given us a credible explanation as to what happened. Now, they've certainly looked into it, and if they had discussed heard the problem, they could have and should have told us about it by now. They should have said, well, there was a bad piece of code or an engineer blundered or we were updating some software and the update didn't go well and that's why we shut it down. They've never told us. Why not? Uh, well, surely they know by now. And so why haven't they told us? Well, the answer is it's probably something nefarious. It probably was hackers. It probably Now, they could be Russian. They could also be Syrian or Iranian. Uh, it could come from a number of sources. But uh, imagine a press release from NASDAQ saying, uh, you know, dear investors, the reason we shut down the exchange in uh, August 2013, only a year ago, by the way, it's, it wasn't 15 years ago, it was uh, not even a full year ago uh, from the date of this podcast. But the reason we're not telling you is because actually it had to do with a Russian virus or attack. Uh, investors would sell everything and move to gold, which you know they, they should do to some extent anyway. You should have some physical gold because one of the things I like about physical gold, it's not digital. Uh, you can't hack my gold. You can't delete and erase my, my gold. You can't you know, hijack it or, or infect it with a computer virus because it's physical bullion. That's, that's one of the great things about having physical gold in your portfolio. Not 100% by any means, but at least 10% just to give you that insurance and have something that, that can't be hacked. So it's highly likely, in my view, that this was a, um, uh, an attack virus. And the reason they're not telling us is because they're worried it would cause panic. And there are national security implications to that. Now, that's one Fact. Now, let's go to a recent article, and I give uh, Bloomberg Business Week uh, credit for breaking this story. But the story itself is old. The story goes back to 2010, uh, but it was only in late July 2014. It's called the cover story is called the Nasdaq Hack. Uh, you can e easily find it online. I've written about it, and, and, and others have as well. Where the Nasdaq, and with help from the FBI and uh, NSA and Department of Homeland Security, actually found a Russian attack virus in the NASDAQ operating system. So this is not speculation. This is not, you know, the range of probabilities. They actually found the bug, traced it back to its source, and determined that it was an attack virus. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't a criminal gang. It was the Russian state. Now, you have to wonder why that story came out now. I mean, uh, credit to the uh, Business Week reporters for getting the scoop. But often that stuff is spoon-fed to reporters from official sources. There's nothing wrong with that, by the way. But so why now? Well, I don't know for sure, but my suspicion was that somebody in the administration wanted to reveal the extent of Russian uh, invasion of U.S. financial exchanges as a way of perhaps showing the Russians that we knew what they were up to as part of this financial war that we talked about earlier. But read the article. It has quotes from... Uh, NSA officials saying that this had the potential to close the exchange. By the way, this is something I know something about more than just as a bystander. Uh, a company that I used to uh, run, I was the uh, second ranking officer along with the CEO, uh, one of the co-operating officers of this company uh, at the senior level, 
actually built the, the NASDAQ order entry system. It's called Super Montage. My former company was uh, Optimark Technologies, and we were building our own stock exchange within NASDAQ. We were in a joint, uh, sort of a joint venture with NASDAQ to build a special, what's called a facility within the NASDAQ. Uh, be so, a little bit like some of these uh, electronic exchanges and blind pools we have today, except this was much earlier in the timeline. We were one of the first. And in time, because we were so well acquainted with NASDAQ, we were asked to actually, uh, and hired to build, as a development company, build their order entry system. Again, uh, the name of, for it is Super Montage, and we did. So I actually ran the company that built that software. We worked very closely with their teams in uh, Toronto, Connecticut, and elsewhere. So I have a good uh, sort of inside working knowledge uh, of, of NASDAQ operating systems, if you will. Uh, so this was familiar terrain uh, to me when um, I read about this particular virus, although I had again, spoken about it, written about it uh, much earlier in other respects. So we're not speculating here, John. This stuff is real. It's happening. Uh, no one's pushed the button. No one's, you know, sort of launched that nuclear weapon, but they can whenever they want. How many bugs have we not discovered? Uh, what's going on in the New York Stock Exchange? And that's what's waiting for us down this road of financial warfare. So I do think that's a reason why people are not in a hurry to escalate. A lot of what's going on is kind of for show. It's certainly not changing Putin's behavior in Ukraine, as we discussed, but more to the point, leaving aside the politicians and the, and the geostrategists, if I'm an investor, I don't want all my wealth in digital form. I want some of my wealth in tangible form, whether it be land, fine art, silver, or physical gold, because those are the things that cannot be wiped out in a computer. Well, the financial war that we're discussing, this conflict, at whatever stage it's at, is not simply between, say, Russia and the United States. There's at least one other major player in the story, and that's Europe. And as I understand, Europe has a huge dependence on Russia for its primary energy supplies. So how does that play into the story? I mean, one thing Russia could do is presumably turn off the tap and, uh, and close the faucet and not supply Europe with much needed energy. Do you think that's a, a possible scenario? Is it likely? What would the implications be? Well, good question, John. It's not only possible and likely, it's actually happened several times. And I talk about this in my first book, actually, Currency Wars. Currency Wars came out in 2011, still selling very well, by the way, I'm happy to, to say, and I, I encourage uh, listeners, even if they've read The Death of Money, uh, to pick up Currency Wars because it's still fresh. Now, the book is almost three years old, but open it up to chapter eight, and there's a long discussion about Russia, Ukraine, and natural gas as a weapon. So that was the things we're talking about today, and, and rightly so, because there are serious concerns. Um, I wrote about anyone who read uh, Currency Wars three years ago when it first came out. Uh, this is old news to them, but I encourage people to pick it up today because it's still very timely. But in fact, Russia has turned off the natural gas several times and parts of Europe froze in the dark in the early 2000s as a result of this weapon. Now, Putin's uh, excuse was always about unpaid bills. He said, hey, you Ukrainians are not paying your bill. It's very interesting how it worked in practice because the natural gas pipelines, not all of them, but many of them run from Russia through Ukraine to all of Europe. They connect to the European pipeline network. The percentage of Russian gas that people get varies country to country. Some of the Eastern European countries, you know, Romania, um, you know, Hungary, Bulgaria, and some others, it's a very high percentage. When you get over to Germany and France, it's a significant percentage, but not quite as high as some of those Eastern European countries. But they're all dependent to, uh, to some extent. Now, what was happening is that uh, there's a certain flow. You have a, a quantity of flow, and there, there are you know, gauges and, and uh, ways of measuring that. And what Russia would say is, to Ukraine is, okay, you know, everyone else paid their bills. You Ukrainians have not paid your bills. So we're going to reduce the flow by the amount of gas that you haven't paid us for. But of course, gas is gas. It's a molecule. It's fungible. So what all the Ukrainians did, when the Russians pumped the gas for everybody else and reduced the flow by the amount that the Ukrainians hadn't paid for, all the Ukrainians did was took, took their gas anyway. And they reduced the flow further down the pipeline. So the guy at the end of the pipeline was the guy who was losing the gas. And the Ukrainians kept taking what they wanted off the top, even though they hadn't paid their bills. 
Well, Putin knew this would happen. I mean, he, it's, he's not a fool. But the point being, you always have a very convenient excuse for turning off the gas because the Ukrainians don't pay their bills. But the impact is felt further down the food chain, if you will, down the pipeline by the end user who's getting less flow because the Ukrainians skimmed off the top. Now, they're building new pipelines. There's Nord Stream, which comes in across the Baltic directly into Germany, bypasses Ukraine. It's one of the reasons for a very tight alliance, uh, by the way, between uh, Russia and Germany. Uh, again, Angela Merkel has to do what she has to do in terms of standing up publicly and uh, chastising Putin over his actions in Ukraine. And Germans have joined in some sanctions, but not very many, not even as many as the United States. So the short answer to the question is, uh, yeah, parts of Europe may be freezing in the dark this winter. And this is not speculation because Putin has, in fact, done it before and he'll do it again. There are a few commentators who see not only uh, Putin having an agenda of expansionism, which you've described in terms of restoring the Russian Empire. There are some people who see still an expansionist agenda in the United States. Do you buy into that or do you see the U.S. as primarily in a defensive posture in this current conflict? I don't even see the U.S. in a defensive posture. I see the U.S. in retreat. And that's Obama's policy. He's the commander in chief. And he clearly, and this is not, again, not my speculation. Just look at the president's own speeches and uh, his famous West Point speech, um, you know, a few months ago. I think there was in uh, May or I think early June, perhaps, where he laid out what might be called the Obama doctrine of a uh, very, very limited engagement. Actually, I was saying no engagement except in very limited circumstances, to put it that way. Again, we're, we're seeing this uh, play out in Iraq, in uh, Syria, in Libya, in Ukraine, in the South China Sea. We're seeing it around the world. And again, John, I want to be clear, I'm not, I'm not really here to debate policy. I may have a policy view and the listeners will have their views. I'm not here to say whether this is right or wrong, I'm here to say it's a fact. And as investors and as analysts, we have to deal with the facts, not the ones we wish were true, but the ones that are actually true. But, you know, one of the most famous dictums of the geopolitics is that, uh, or science for that matter, is, uh, you know, nature abhors a vacuum. When you create a vacuum, it doesn't remain. Someone or something rushes in to fill it. And when the U.S. withdraws power, you create a power vacuum, and it's not long before others rush in to fill it. Uh, and of course, that's exactly the, the kind of behavior we're seeing from the Russians. So, yeah, no U.S. boots on the ground in Ukraine. That's almost inconceivable. But perhaps, and think very highly likely, Russian boots. By the way, John, just one uh, addition to uh, my comments and the answer to your prior question. Uh, you know, when this natural gas cuts, gets cut off to Europe, I described it as, you know, Europeans freezing in the dark, meaning your home and your heat and, uh, you know, the, the electric plant runs on natural gas and your heat runs on natural gas and you have no heat or light. Well, that's a serious issue. But uh, the bigger issue is industry. A lot of manufacturing capability in Europe run, is natural gas powered. So you're not just causing inconvenience at the home. You're shutting down industry. You're shutting down manufacturing. You're shutting down jobs. So the economic ripple effects of this are enormous. And this comes on top of the already weak uh, global economy, which, which we spoke about. So there's just no way out of this. Putin is uh, he's not deterred. He's not afraid. He's not going to he's gone this far. Why would he stop now? He's going to get what he wants. There's not much the U.S. can do about it. And if we try, we're going to have one or more of these unintended consequences, which are either financial catastrophe or just economic uh, catastrophe in terms of reduced global growth. Well, I'm glad you turned to that last point, because this is where I wanted to sort of round this out and talking about the economic impacts of the scenarios that we've been discussing. And also, if I might ask you, the potential impacts on the monetary system, which has been a continuous theme of our conversations. How do you see this playing out in terms of its impact on the fate of the dollar, on the currency wars, and on the role of gold in the near future? Well, we, we spoke about these uh, potential economic sanctions. I don't think it'll go that far, but uh, there is a lot the U.S. can do. But everything the U.S. can do, every financial weapon that the United States can throw at Russia involves the dollar. Dollar payments, dollar clearance, dollar settlement, uh, dollars for export, dollars for energy. It all revolves around 
the dominant role of the dollar as the number one reserve currency and, for that matter, the number one trade currency. Uh, and, of course, we've spoken before about how there's a difference between a reserve currency and a trade currency. A lot of people confuse the two. Uh, they look at these Chinese bilateral uh, currency swap deals and think that that's the launch of, uh, of the yuan as, as a global reserve currency. It's not. Uh, it's significant, but this, this really has to do with your status as a trade currency. But getting back to the dollar, the dollar dominates both. So if you're, I mean, you go back to the Cold War, if the U.S. is building up its nuclear arsenal, when Russia wants to build up its nuclear arsenal as well, Russia was very good at stealing U.S. nuclear secrets during the, um, uh, toward the end of World War II and, the, and the, uh, throughout the Cold War, because they wanted to sort of uh, meet that threat head on. So now we're in a financial war. Putin's looking at the dollar as the equivalent of a ICBM, you know, intercontinental ballistic missile. He's not going to stand still for that. So he wants to get off under the dollar system. Now, wanting to get out and being able to get out are two different things. But we've already talked about how Russians are great chess players, how uh, Putin is a strategic thinker and a good chess player. So you can be certain that Russia is moving behind the scenes to get out from under the dollar payment system. How are they doing this? Well, one way they're doing it is by acquiring gold. Of course, China's doing the same thing. We've spoken a lot in the past, some of the prior podcasts that uh, listeners can go back to uh, about Chinese acquisition of gold. But the Russian central bank, Central Bank of Russia, has been a major acquirer of gold also. And recently, they've picked up the tempo uh, for years, uh, for about five years, from uh, 2009 through 2013, they had been acquiring about 100 tons a year. Uh, and they, they were actually very fairly transparent about it. China was very, as we know, very non-transparent. They lie about their gold holdings. But Russia was, um, you know, every month you could actually go to the Central Bank of Russia website and they would update their reserve positions and they include gold in their reserves. And you would see that, okay, they added eight tons or seven tons or five tons, but it was about 100 tons a year. And they gradually got their gold uh, reserves up from about 600 tons in, in 2009 to uh, over 1,000 tons recently, but they're still going. They've increased those purchases, uh, so they're now acquiring at a rate uh, higher than 100 tons a year. A lot of this comes from their own mining output. Uh, they don't have to go to the London bullion market. They are one of the largest gold producers in the world, so all they have to do is capture their own production, uh, send it to refineries, and obviously turn it into good delivery bars uh, and stick it in a vault. And, and I guarantee that vault's in Russia. It's not at the Federal Reserve Bank in New York. The Russians aren't foolish enough to leave their gold uh, with the Federal Reserve. They're still acquiring gold. Now, that does not mean that tomorrow morning we wake up and the ruble is a gold-backed global reserve currency. I don't expect that at all. There are so many problems with Russian corruption, Russian rule of law, uh, the absence of a significant Russian bond market. We're not going to see the ruble be a global reserve currency anytime soon. But what it does let you do is to start to do uh, gold transactions, uh, gold swaps. And we've seen this recently, a very large, uh, of course, there was a lot of publicity in uh, July around this massive China, Russia, multi-year, multi-10 uh, billion dollar uh, natural gas and oil uh, trade and development deal. It was a very big deal. But Russia recently announced a similar, uh, admittedly somewhat smaller, but still quite a large deal with Iran. But Iran is another country that's undergoing economic sanctions. So here you have two countries, big ones, Russia and Iran, that are the target of U.S. economic sanctions. Iran actually was kicked out of the dollar payment system with Russia. That hasn't happened yet, but it's a threat. And they're finding each other and saying, you know, we can, we can trade oil for gold and um, uh, oil for other currencies. Now, what's interesting is that Russia agreed to buy Iranian oil. Now, that's odd. Russia is one of the largest uh, oil exporters in the world. They're actually, uh, if they're not first, they're, they're, they might be second, but they're one of the top one or two. So if Russia is a major oil exporter, why would they want to import oil from Iran? Well, the reason is the Iranians cannot very easily sell their oil in the open market because of U.S. sanctions. So suddenly, Iran sells the oil to Russia. Well, of course, oil is generic. It's fungible. Oil is oil. It doesn't have a little, there's no little sticker on the molecule that says this came from Iran or this came from Russia. So once Russia gets their hands on Iranian oil, they can re-export it to the Chinese and in effect act as middlemen in the sale of Iranian oil to China to kind of keep the Chinese hands clean. Uh, and China just did a currency swap 
with Switzerland so they can get their hands on Swiss francs. And Russia and China are members of this BRICS bank. So you start to connect the dots and say, okay, China's got easy access to Swiss francs. Swiss franc is a highly desirable hard, hard currency. Iran's selling oil to Russia. Russia can resell it to China. China can pay Russia in Swiss francs, and they can intermediate all this through their BRICS bank. So all of a sudden, where's the dollar? Dollar's not there. So I think that you have to look at all the pieces, John. You have to look at the BRICS developments, look at the Iranian developments, look at the currency swaps. And all these countries are working behind the scenes to end the dollar hegemony. The U.S. seems to be asleep at the switch. This doesn't happen overnight, but it is happening in ways that are accelerating. I think investors will wake up one day and find that the dollar is in free fall and, and they won't know why, but you can really see this coming. So, Jim, thanks for this very revealing discussion of the global situation, this extraordinary complex interplay uh, around reducing the status of the dollar over time. Now, what are the implications for investors? You've mentioned investors a few times, and I'm glad you have in the course of this conversation. But let's give some focus here. What is the individual, and not only the individual, we have listeners who, who are responsible for other people's wealth as well as their own. What is the guardianship? What is the stewardship that is most appropriate in the environment that you're describing here? Well, John, there's a short answer and a long answer. Uh, The short answer is one word, which is gold. But let me expand on that a little bit because there are a lot of people out there who kind of bang the table and say you need to get some gold. And they have this sort of chicken little skies falling routine, but they don't uh, offer much in the way of analysis. And if I were an investor who was not familiar with gold, who did not have gold in portfolio, some of the gold advocates would not be particularly persuasive to me because I do think they rely on fear and hysteria rather than analysis. So let's try to give investors some analysis that they can judge for themselves as to why physical gold should be in your portfolio. And let's just take the two things we we just talked about. And one way to illustrate uh, this is to think about Bitcoin. I don't recommend Bitcoin in portfolios, but, you know, people, uh, you know, there are a lot of Bitcoin fans out there and uh, and we, we don't have to really spend a lot of time on Bitcoin, but people refer to Bitcoin as a digital currency. Well, the dollar is a digital currency. Yeah, we may have a few dollars in our pockets if I go to the grocery store. I may pull out a $20 bill, but probably not. I'll probably pull out my debit card. And if you think of how the dollar payment system works, it's completely digital. Probably, you know, when you get your paycheck, it's a a direct deposit to your account. Uh, When you pay your bills, you're probably using online banking. Uh, When you go shopping, you probably use a credit card. Uh, The amount of cash you're using is tiny relative to the economic transactions, and certainly at the portfolio level, it's all digital. In fact, the the largest securities market in the world, the United States Treasury uh, market, uh, hasn't had a physical paper certificate, I think, since the early 1980s. There might be a few old, old ones floating around in someone's attic. The physical paper treasury bond market went away, I think, in 1982, certainly in the early 80s. That's completely digital, and the payment system is digital. So, And that's what we use as a weapon. But what does it say when your wealth is digital, but digital wealth is subject to uh, power outages, infrastructure collapses, hackers, online theft, other forms of you know exchange collapses, et cetera. Um, everyone says, oh, I've got all the, I've got a big dollar portfolio. I've got a billion dollar dollar portfolio. Well, well what good is that if it can be um, in effect wiped out? Overnight, so that's one problem right there. The second problem we talked about is is the dollar itself. Uh, we don't even have to hypothesize a digital wipeout. We could have a dollar wipeout through a collapse of confidence because uh, the Fed does not understand the statistical properties of risk. The Fed um, thinks they can print money in unlimited quantities to deal with macroeconomic problems that they can't really deal with because those problems are structural, not monetary. And they're trying to use a monetary solution to a structural problem. That won't work, but they think it'll work. So they keep trying and doubling down. Uh, you can collapse confidence very easily there. Plus, we know that Russia and China and Iran and the BRICS and others are actively working night and day behind the scenes to get away from the dollar, independent of whether the Fed crashes at first. So you've got all these uh, vectors that are threatening the dollar. So let's say you have digital dollar denominated wealth. Well, digital assets are under attack. The dollar is under attack. And when you have digital dollars in your portfolio, you have exponential greater risk because you've got the two things combined. And so how can you mitigate that? Well, 
you know, I don't expect that a, someone with a $10 billion portfolio is going to require $10 billion of gold. Good luck with that. But you should have some gold as your insurance, and it should be physical gold because uh, an ETF is just digital gold. A uh, COMEX future is digital gold. Uh, even a contract with JP Morgan, uh, it might be on paper somewhere. But it's still a contract, and contracts can be terminated under various termination clauses, force majeure clauses. They'll send you a check for yesterday's price, and you'll miss out on tomorrow's spike. You won't get your gold when you want it, et cetera. So if you don't have some physical gold in your portfolio, you are vulnerable to all these other other things. And so and investors are rightly worried about Let's call it normal market risk. You know, we've seen the stock market draw down lately. Will that get worse? Will it bounce back? You know, it, it's hard to say, but uh, we certainly there's certainly cause for concern there. So, is growth as strong as people think it is? Are earnings as strong? These are the things that investors normally worry about. You know, growth, earnings per share. Um, you know, the the macroeconomic environment. What I'm suggesting is that there are even more serious concerns on top of that, geopolitical concerns, uh, digital concerns, uh, confidence concerns, things that could collapse the value of a portfolio. And the way to ensure against all of that is with some physical goal because you can't hack it, you can't wipe it out. And it's not dollar based. Now, that's another point of confusion, John. People say, well, I've got gold. And it's worth, you know, today's price is, you know, it's around $1,300 an ounce, a little bit more. And they say, oh, gee, you know, my gold's going to go down to 1250 or someone else will say it'll go up to 1375 It's bouncing around. People get very hung up on the dollar price of gold. And what I try to explain to investors is gold is money. When you have gold, you should think about the quantity of gold and what that represents in terms of your portfolio. But don't get too hung up on the dollar price because the dollar could collapse very quickly, and then the dollar price won't matter. What will matter is how much gold you have. In that scenario, you may not be able to get it, so the time to get it is now. But if you start, instead of thinking about gold in terms of dollars, if you start thinking about dollars in terms of gold, you know, is make gold your benchmark, make gold your numeraire, ask yourself one question. In the years ahead, given all the risks we've described, given all the dangers we've described, is the dollar going to get stronger or weaker? If you think the dollar is going to get stronger, you might not want so much gold. But if you think it's going to get weaker, which I do, then you certainly want some gold. And so you don't have to correlate gold to anything. Just think of gold as money. Uh, think of it as the inverse of the dollar and or the anti-dollar, if you will. And if you're concerned about the dollar, and I think there's good reason to be concerned about the dollar, then you certainly want some gold. Well, thank you, Jim Rickards. It's been great having you with us today and once again. And thank you to our listeners. You can follow Jim Rickards on Twitter. His handle is at James G. Rickards. And speaking of Twitter, please share your questions for our next podcast. The hashtag is Ask Jim Rickards, followed by your question. And wherever you post that on Twitter, we'll find your question. We'd love to hear from you. So once again, thank you, Jim. And thank you to our listeners. And we'll see you next time.